Preston, please sign up on that today. Uh, also, for those that are visiting for the first time or repeat visitors, uh, please fill out the sidebar in the bulletin with your uh, contact information. Let us know that you're here. Uh, we want to recognize that uh, in our prayers and in a greeting. This morning's psalm, we turn to Psalm 119. Verses 169 through 176. It has taken us several weeks to get through this longest psalm, and today we finish it. Uh, this last stanza contains a prayer for the Lord's salvation. The issues in the author's life have still not been resolved, despite the 21 previous stanzas. But the design of this psalm and this conclusion is that it raises the spirit of expectation. The psalmist expects uh, that God will intervene because of his loving commitment to believers and the promises that we read in God's word. The psalmist prays for deliverance and grace so that he may sing the praise of his loving and faithful God. The last few verses repeat this theme. We read a prayer, a commitment to God's word or his precepts and laws, and an anticipation to praise the Lord for his redemption. Much like today in Resurrection Day, the psalmist was looking forward to this reality. The psalmist knows that he too will praise his Redeemer. He doesn't have all of the details spelled out yet but he holds God accountable for his word and his promise. The last note of the psalm, however, is a cry from a broken spirit. The writer feels helpless as a result of the adversities that he's lived through and the persecution that he so frequently mentioned, and not because of his ne neglect of God or his word. So with that, please read along with me in Psalm 119. Starting at verse 169. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on this stanza and indeed the entirety of this psalm, we hear a persistent call from the writer for you to deliver him from his troubles. The psalmist repeatedly comes before you with a broken spirit as he offers his prayer to the Lord. And weekly as a body of believers, we do the very same thing. We often find that we have nothing left to present but a cry and a supplication for your mercy. We need understanding to know your word and to discern how we may best respond to these adversities with hope in the promises we find in it. You've made it clear through this psalm that it is through reading and meditating on your word that we understand of what divine deliverance truly consists. The deliverance you seek or that we seek is an expression of your kingship and particularly of your characteristic perfections your strength, righteousness, and justice. In our lament, confession, and adversity, we are calling on you to reach down from on high and rescue us in our need. And the entirety of Scripture provides the pattern and substance of deliverance as it forms the story of redemption. The words save, salvation, savior, redeem, redemption, and redeemer 
are greatly filled with meaning as we consider these terms today on Resurrection Sunday. Unfortunately, the phrase, I have been saved, has become simply identical to I have become a Christian. The biblical concept of being saved is so much more beyond that understanding. It must include the richness, the extreme truth of the New Testament. Because it is there, we come face to face with our great Redeemer, your Son, Jesus Christ. If we paint the New Testament redemption with the richness of the old, we understand that you completely redeem your people from all adversity, remove our troubles and tears, vindicate us, honor us, and bestow a new quality of life on us, but only as you're adopted. The fullness of these promises, the forgiveness of sin, reconciliation to a righteous God, divine compassion in the present, and the expectation of your care for us in body and in spirit only come through a deep and abiding fellowship with you. And this depth of relationship has been modeled by your son and his tra trail to the cross. The New Testament reality of Christ's life, death, burial, resurrection, and return establishes that you alone are our Savior and no one or nothing else can give meaning to life. You, O oh Lord, are the all-sufficient one, and we praise you as the author and perfecter of our faith. So we praise you for your all-encompassing and overwhelming love, grace, and mercy to us as seen through Friday's death and today's resurrection. We acknowledge today that Jesus' kingdom is not something that remains in the future. Christ is king right this minute. He is on the seat of the highest cosmic authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to your anointed son. The Apostle Paul confirms what the psalmist has repeatedly instructed through this psalm. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. So it's to this truth and to your praise we commit the rest of this service and our lives beyond. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and lift our voices. Make a joyful noise with Christ the Lord is risen today.
Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there? you this morning on this Resurrection Sunday. God, we're so thankful for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we continue to worship you now through the preaching of the word, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to hear what you have for us today in the text. We give you the glory in all things and pray that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you take a second and greet somebody, a little forced fellowship. Say howdy to your neighbors. Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Real Tree Church. He is risen. He is risen Amen. Praise the Lord, huh? On this Resurrection Sunday, we are going to be studying a passage from Matthew's Gospel. No shock, right? But today, we're going to skip ahead to the appropriate account of the resurrection. So I invite you to take your Bibles in hand and turn with me over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And this morning we will consider the first 10 verses. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. We will go over the details leading up to the resurrection in depth when we get to them in our weekly study of Matthew's gospel. But for today, let me set the scene for you. Our Lord has been arrested. He has been put through a sham 
trial with, with false accusations. He's been flogged with the cat of nine tails. He has had a crown of thorns jammed down on his head. He has been mocked, beat, spit upon, ridiculed, made fun of, and finally, he has been crucified. Our Lord was laid down on a Roman cross where Roman soldiers took large iron spikes and drove them through his wrists and feet. And then the cross was lifted up and dropped into a previously dug hole where all of his weight would have fallen then on those spikes that are driven through his wrists and feet. This took place on Friday morning. And for six hours, our Lord hung and suffered on the Roman cross before giving up his spirit and dying. And then just to make sure he was dead, a Roman soldier who would have certainly been an expert in death drove a spear up through his ribs and into his heart. There's no doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ was dead. He was dead. And then our Lord was taken down from the cross by two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. These two men came and took our Lord's body down. They wrapped him in, in burial clothes and, and they laid him in a new tomb that belonged to Joseph. The women who we will encounter in our text today followed these two men. They followed Joseph and Nicodemus to the burial site so that they would know exactly where the Lord was buried because they intended to come back and add their own touch to preparing our Lord's body for burial. It was a Friday evening, and the Sabbath began at sunset, so there was a bit of a rush to get our Lord off the cross, prepared for burial, and into the tomb before the Sabbath began. So our Lord is dead and buried on Friday, He's in the tomb on Saturday, and He arose on Sunday where we will pick up our narrative today. Now, in our modern way of counting time, that does not add up to three days, does it? It doesn't add up to three days. However, the way the Jews counted time, any part of a day was considered a day. So Jesus was in the grave Friday, that's one day. Saturday, that's two days. And Sunday, that's three. He came out of the grave on Sunday morning, three days. That brings us to our passage this morning, I invite you to stand with me in reverence for the reading of the word of the living God. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. This is the immutable, infallible word of the living God. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here in this place today, Lord, and study what happened on that day some 2,000 years ago. Lord, as we go through this text, I pray that you would help us to understand it. Lord, if there are some here who don't know you, I pray that you would open their hearts and minds today and draw them to yourself. Lord, we plead for the souls of those who are lost. And God, we give you glory in all things and pray that your will would be done in our lives individually as well as the life of this church. 
And it's through Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. There are a lot of religions in the world today. And most of those religions, or at least a large number of them, are represented to one degree or another here in America. In fact, America is a place where people are supposed to be able to come and worship the God of their choosing without fear of persecution. Right? We have freedom of religion, supposedly. Because of that, because of that fact, all the major religions of the world are fairly well represented within the United States. Now, if you were to go to a state-run university, you would discover that it is that it's quite likely that the professors in those universities will treat those, all these different religions as equally valid. That is, they view all the religions as being equally valid, the same. One is not more worth more or more true than another. Could that be true? Is there any chance that all the different religions with all the trappings that go along with them could all be valid, equally valid? If you were to consider all these religions, if you were to begin to examine them and how they operate and how they work, you would find that they all fit into one of two categories. Either they are based on man's achievement or they're based on divine achievement. That is, either they are based on what man can do, or they are based on what God has done. Now, I did a little study, a little research, and there are roughly 4,200 known religions worldwide. 4,200. And of those 4,200 religions... 4,199 of them fall into the category of man's achievement. Did you get that? 4,199 of them fall into man's achievement. By that I mean that that 4,199 of the world religions are based on man doing something in and of himself in order to earn his way into heaven or paradise or whatever it is that they consider to be the afterlife. All of them. Only one. Only one, that is true biblical Christianity, is based on God's achievement. Only one. Think of that. Just consider a few of the world religions. Take Buddhism, for example. Buddhism was founded by a guy named Siddhartha Gautama, I think is how you say it, in 520 B.C. Guess where old Siddhartha is today? Yeah, he's in the grave. He's dead. Worm food. How about Hinduism? Bahadis Maharaj is the founder of Hinduism. Guess where that fellow is? Yep, he's dead. What about Islam? We hear a lot about Islam today and how it's the supposed religion of peace, right? Muhammad founded Islam in 622 A.D. Guess where old Muhammad is right now? That's right. He's dead. The only founder of any world religion who is still alive is the Lord Jesus Christ. The risen Christ appeared to more than 500 people on 12 different occasions within the first 40 days after his resurrection, and all of this is well documented. I want you to consider that for just a moment. If I were to do something, say, illegal, now, not that I've ever done anything illegal, but if I were to do something that was illegal, and I did it only once, and there were only two people who witnessed, witnessed me do that, it's quite likely, if not certain, that unless I was a politician, I would be found guilty and thrown in jail. Right? With only two witnesses, guilt could likely be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Yet here we have documented eyewitnesses, more than 500 of them, 
claiming to have seen the risen Christ with their own eyes on 12 different occasions. And people still refuse to believe. I believe much of that unbelief stems from simple ignorance of the facts. People are just ignorant of the facts of the resurrection. Today we are going to examine one of the first recorded instances of people coming into contact with the risen Savior. Let's go back now and work our way through this passage and see what our Lord has in it for us today. Take a look at verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. After the Sabbath, in this case refers to Sunday morning. The Sabbath had ended at sunset on Saturday evening. So it's after the Sabbath. The, the, this, the time frame now for us to understand, as noted by Matthew, is the first day of the week. It's Sunday morning. The Gospel of John tells us that it was just before sunrise when these women made their way to the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew leaves out the, the purpose for which these women were coming to the tomb because his point is the resurrection, not why the women went to the tomb. However, from the other gospel accounts, we learn that they too wanted to anoint the body of our Lord. They wanted to add to his burial. They, they were seeking to add their touch to the burial preparations done by Nicodemus on Friday evening. Matthew tells us that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were present. The other Mary is a reference to, the Mary, to Mary, the mother of James. We know that there were two other women with the two Marys from the other Gospels, Salome, the mother of James and John, and a woman known as, known as Joanna. But for one reason or another, Matthew leaves these other women out of his account. Matthew's purpose is not to give a detailed account as to who was present at the tomb, but rather to tell the reader about the resurrection. Obviously, these women were not coming to the tomb expecting to see Jesus alive, were they? Rather, they were coming to mourn, to pay their respects, to anoint the body of our Lord. Now verses 2 and 3 together. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. Can you imagine? When our Lord died on Friday, there was an earthquake. When the angel of the Lord comes to roll away the stone, there's another earthquake. There was an earthquake on Mount Sinai just before God revealed the law to Moses. There was an earthquake on Mount Horeb when God revealed himself to Elijah. And we're told that there will be earthquakes before the Lord returns in the future. Supernatural earthquakes accompany revelation from the Lord in some instances. And look how Matthew describes the angel as being like lightning and wearing clothing that as white as snow. This language indicates to us power, the power of lightning and purity, the purity of white snow and it's important to note that the angel rolled away the stone but the angel rolled away the stone not in order for jesus to be able to escape the tomb if our lord had the power to raise himself from the dead which we are told that he did in john 10 18 then he certainly could get out of the tomb the angel rolled the stone away so that the women could get into the tomb Now verse 4, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. What happened to the big tough Roman guards when they came into contact with an angel of the Lord? They literally shook in their sandals and they fainted dead away. They fainted dead away. They became paralyzed with fear at the mere sight of the angel of the Lord. That should tell us something about angels, shouldn't it? They must be some awesome creatures. But look what the angel told the women in verses 5 and 6. But the angel said to the women, 
Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. This angel scares the guards, these Roman guards, nearly to death. But he tells the women, fear not. Fear not. He knows why they're at the tomb. He knows that these women are seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. But guess what? He's not here. He's not here. He's not in the tomb where you expect him to be because he is risen. Note that he says, just as he said he would. Do you see that little bit there? Jesus had told his disciples and the women following him that he would rise from the grave, and he had told them that on many occasions. Yet they didn't comprehend what he was saying. And it's not hard to understand why, is it? I mean, rising from the dead is not something that we encounter every day, right? It's not an everyday occurrence. So it's no wonder the disciples and the women did not fully understand what our Lord was speaking of when he was talking about rising from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen. Come, look in the tomb, the angel tells them. He's not here. What an awesome message. The women saw with their own eyes that Jesus was not in the tomb. The tomb was empty. Now verse 7, as the angel continues... Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. It's interesting that the fascination and amazement of these women must quickly turn into proclamation. He's not here. Go tell somebody. He's risen. Go tell somebody. The angel tells the women to go and tell the disciples and then then get to Galilee because That's where Jesus is going. He's going to meet them there. And they did as the angel commanded. Verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. The women were still experiencing a bit of fear. No doubt from the sight of the angel. If he scared the Roman guards to stiff, he probably was a little scary to look at. But now their fear is tempered with joy. They begin to think, could it be? Could it be that what this angel has said is true? Surely you can imagine the joy being beginning to fill the hearts of these women as they pondered on the wonder of the resurrection and began to try to understand it. And as the fear fades and the joy builds, look what happens next in verse 9. Matthew says, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Think of those women. It most certainly is true. Here he stands. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Master, has indeed risen from the dead. Now, the greeting here that our Lord uses is a very common greeting, one that was used every day. It'd be like saying, hey, how you doing? Hello. Good morning. The risen Savior, the creator of the universe, defeats the grave. And the first thing he says when he greets his followers is simply, hello. How you doing? As the writer of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. In spite of the very casual greeting, the women have the correct response to an encounter with the living God because that's what he is. He's the living God and they they fall on their face before him in worship. They take hold of his feet. These women knew beyond a shadow of a doubt at this point that they were in the presence of the risen Messiah, the divine Son of God. And they responded correctly in worship and adoration. This is indeed the proper response to an encounter with the Savior. Worship and adoration. We tend to think that Jesus is some sort of a good old boy that we can just chum around with. 
We tend to think of him more as a friend than as God. We need to correct and adjust that thinking just a bit. There's no doubt that our Lord loves us. He is our friend. And just as he shows love and kindness to these women, he will also show love and kindness to all those who truly belong to him. But make no mistake, he is the supreme sovereign of the universe. He is God Almighty and deserves and demands our reverence and worship. I want you to see what the Apostle Paul tells the church in Philippi. Paul says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, him being Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, there is coming a day in the future when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that this Jesus who was crucified on that Roman cross is in fact, indeed, the Lord of all creation. That day's coming. Believers and unbelievers alike will fall at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and confess that he is indeed the sovereign of all creation. I am looking forward to that day. And finally, verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Our Lord comforts the women as the angel did, assuring them that there is no need to be afraid, just as the angel did. And as the angel did, our Lord tells the women to go tell the disciples and then meet him in Galilee. In a very simple, matter-of-fact way, Matthew has related to us, to his readers, the truth of the resurrection. It is important to note, and I want you to note, that the very first people to witness the risen Savior were women. Now today, that doesn't seem like a big deal. But in our Lord's day, if one was to fabricate a story such as something, someone rising from the dead, that person certainly would not have used women as eyewitnesses because the testimony of a woman held no weight in court. I want you to see this quote from Dr. Craig Bloomberg. He notes this in his commentary. He says, The women will become the first witnesses to the resurrection, a fact that seems to guarantee the credibility of the account in a world that usually did not accept women's testimony as legally binding. Were the story fabricated, only male witnesses would have appeared. A little detail that we don't see today. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has been examined by the most staunch of critics. The evidence has been gone over with a fine-tooth comb by historians and lawyers and everything in between. Many of those people were seeking, hoping, desiring to discredit it. But the fact of the matter is it cannot be refuted. It cannot be disproved. Now, you can simply choose not to believe it in the same manner that perhaps you choose not to believe that the world is a sphere or that Elvis is dead. But you cannot base that choice of unbelief on anything other than your refusal to believe because there is no evidence to substantiate your unbelief. None. In fact, just the opposite is true. And those men who recorded the record of this event, the apostles, the disciples of our Lord, they all suffered many hardships. Most of them even were killed for it. And they never refuted it, never recanted it. Never. I usually don't show you quotes from anyone other than a theologian, but I want to look what he says. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. 
Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Oh, old Chuck Colson isn't a theologian, but he hits a nail on the head there. There is no doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ was in fact dead and now is in fact alive. In fact, there can be no Christianity without the resurrection. The faith of Christianity cannot exist without the reality of the resurrection. It's really as simple as that. So that brings us to a few items that we need to consider. First and foremost, if Jesus predicted that he would rise from the grave and then in fact did, it, did exactly what he said he would do, we are left with no other option other than he is indeed exactly who he claims to be, the very Son of God, God incarnate. Which leads us to the next item. If Jesus is who he says he is, then he will do what he says he will do. That means that he is, in fact, coming back to judge the living and the dead. That means that he is, in fact, the only way to heaven and there is no other. He very clearly said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those are his words. Salvation is found in no other name. Of the 4,200 different religions and supposed ways to God known to man, according to God himself, only one of those is valid. Only one of those is valid. Biblical Christianity. All the others lead to damnation. There is no middle ground. And finally, that leaves us with a decision to make. What are we then going to do with this information? What are we going to do with this truth? If biblical Christianity is true and the evidence is overwhelming that it is, then what the Bible says about the condition of man and the way to take advantage of salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ offers must also be true. And I know no one likes to hear it, but the Bible says very clearly that there is no one who is good. There is no one who is good. There's no one who does good and no one who seeks after God, it says, as a matter of fact. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and, and need to be redeemed. We've all lied or stolen something or looked at someone with lust. The list could go on and on. We're all guilty. And in order to be redeemed, we must forsake our sins. We must repent. To repent means to change our mind. It means to, to stop worshiping you, me, and start worshiping God. And at the same time, we must trust in Christ and his death on the cross to pay for our transgressions. The penalty of sin is death. And Jesus died in our place. And we know that God accepted that sacrifice because on the third day, he rose again. You trust in his perfect life, his perfect death, and his perfect resurrection instead of your ability to be good or your church membership or your baptism to put you into right standing with God and you will be saved. That is how you come to the Father. Not through your goodness or your good works or any of the other 4,000 some religions of the world, but only through repentance and faith in Christ. The resurrection is true, which means the Bible is true which means that what Jesus said is true. I implore you not to leave here today without taking advantage of the mercy and grace that's extended to us by our loving Savior. He offers you salvation, and I beg that, that you take advantage of that offer before it's too late. Because one day it'll be too late. One day you will die, and if you die in your sins without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will most assuredly perish in hell for all eternity. So please don't delay. Don't delay. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Repent and believe on Christ today and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your mercy and grace that we can look at the text of Scripture and see that in fact, 
Jesus did rise from the dead. And in fact, what he said is true. And it is the way that you've provided for us to be made right with you, to be put into right standing with you. Father, if there are those here today who don't know you, I pray that you would move on their heart, open their hearts and their minds to your truth and draw them to yourself. Grant them repentance, increase their faith that they might trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. Lord, we are humbled by your mercy and grace and your long suffering. Help us to take advantage of it. Help us to love you more and love each other rightly. And Lord, as we go about the rest of our day today, I pray that you would be blessed and encouraged and we can encourage one another and, and give you glory through our fellowship as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you the glory in all things, in all ways, and pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, would you come forward, please? May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor upon you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
Have a great resurrection day. Go serve your king. you would take my place, and you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, and I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Thank you.